And so I'd like to um, officially welcome Paul to our webinar series. This is our eighth webinar of the year, which is pretty amazing. Um, and this webinar is being uh, sponsored by the Mathematics Intensive College Mathematics Committee of AMATIC. Um, this is, these webinars are all sponsored by the American Mathematical Association of Two-Year Colleges. And one of the things that we're really trying to promote this year is enhancing professional personal growth. Um, you can find more information on our website. Uh, views presented by presenters are not necessarily the views of AMATIC, and if commercial products are mentioned, they're not endorsed by AMATIC in any way. And this webinar platform is being provided by the Lyft Institute at Muskegon Community College. And if you have ideas for future webinars, please just feel free to contact me. That's me, Maria Anderson. And uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Paul. So give me a second here to hide this. And okay, am I still on? <laughs> I'm going to turn off my mic so I don't accidentally make any noise. Okay, can everyone hear me? I hope so, if I see a yes. Uh, my name is Paul Seberger, and I am from Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York. I've uh, worked for 13 years at developing applets to help uh, students visualize calculus in particular. And um, more recently, I've been involved in an NSF grant project that um, uh, has been focused on helping students visualize multivariable calculus. So I'm going to actually ask a few questions of you before I get too far into it. I want to see what you're interested in and, and what you teach. So I'd like to um, do one of the polls. Um, let's see. Why don't we start with poll one? So just to answer what levels you teach. OK. So then we could try. Um, well, I guess I can sort of see from that what uh, would be for the second poll. Why don't we try poll three? And let's just see uh, if you have uh, the red cyan 3D glasses or not uh, that were advertised for this uh, webinar. All right, the trend appears to be uh, not as many people have them. Um, I may show it then, but not as much. But if you have them, you'll be able to experiment with them later. And if you don't, you can certainly get, it, get them and, and use them uh, in the future. But I'll show you how to use them in a couple of the applets that I show today. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Why don't we try, uh, let's see. Why don't we try poll six? This is uh, asking what technology you currently use in your calculus courses. And you can select all that apply, all that you've used. Once it comes up there, it disappeared for me. <laughs> there it is. Looks like it, got, it may have gotten reset. All right, great. Um, it looks like uh, you've, many of you have used um, a number of different uh, types of technology, and that's it, it's good. That's probably why you're here watching this webinar uh, to learn about some more. Um, I didn't put a poll together, but it would be interesting to know if some of you have used my applets before. But uh, we can worry about that later. Um, why don't we go ahead and start this uh, the slideshow. So I'm going to just sort of mention a couple of the applets I'd like to go through today. Uh, I'm going to present uh, some single variable calculus applets. And I'm also going to present uh, a multivariable calculus focused applet that I worked on in my NSF grant. The uh, so single variable calculus applets I've got, uh, there's a whole lot of them on my website. But this is some of the highlight uh, applets I wanted to show. I've got a calculus grapher, which does some interesting uh, calculus visualizations and just graphs functions and so on. We'll look at that in a minute. A Riemann sum applet, uh, a slope field grapher, a volume of revolution, both a washer and a shell method applet. I'll probably just show the shell. And then a volume of a common cross section visualization that we're going to take a look at. Um, so that is sort of what I have in mind. Um, now, why do we use visualization and calculus? I wanted to just briefly cover some of these ideas uh, that I have in mind, anyway, as I use um, these tools. And then we'll get into some of the tools and maybe come back to some other things here. So first of all, calculus is the mathematics of change. Uh, limits that we start with, usually at the very beginning of the course, are defined in terms of change. We look at uh, a series of values, and we move uh, 
we let values approach uh, target values and see whether the, the uh, function value is approaching something. So that has to do with uh, something dynamic. Uh, derivatives represent rates of change, and definite integrals represent uh, total change in an antiderivative function. So there's a lot of things changing. And it's hard to see on a chalkboard or in the textbook. And so I think uh, we probably all agree that the motion uh, that we can use in an applet can really help bring these things alive and, and bring the concepts more clearly to our students. Secondly, visualization helps to make the geometric uh, and motion-related connections become clear and, and I think also much easier to remember when the students actually see it in addition to hopefully having it in their mind's eye. I do teach a lot of things still with the chalkboard first uh, and then I show the visualization after that. So I've sort of tried to hope students have gotten the idea in their heads and they sort of nod and, and appear to understand. But then when you show them with the applets uh, and make it just come to life, I think it really helps to make those things uh, more memorable for them and uh, enjoyable as well. Um, when students get to play with the concepts, when they actually get their hands on these applets, and I'm requiring them to do that at times uh, in order to get them to do so, but there's many studies that have been done that when you play with something, you learn it better. And I think that uh, we probably all agree to that, although I'm sure more research could be done to, to help prove that. Another thing that visualizations do for a lecture is that they vary the format. And I think we probably, if we've used them before, which many of you have, understand that. It just helps uh, students keep their attention longer uh, when you break up the format with, a, with an applet. And another thing I'd love to be able to do more of, and we've, we've I've done some of, but I'd like to really see this happen even more, is that the visualizations can help students to become uh, engaged in the concepts more actively. Uh, by asking what if questions. And um, I've done that a, a few times, I should say, with the multivariable calculus, especially in the topic of uh, space curves and what happens if you parameterize them in different ways. But there are many different questions we can ask the what if questions about. And using sliders, begin to get students involved in thinking about what's happening. All right, I'm going to actually go ahead now and look at some applets with you. And so I'm going to need to screen share here. Let's see. All right, let me get to an actual screen that I want to show. Um, OK, hopefully you can see this. Um, this is my web page. Um, it is, um, I will put it on a, a web page for you to, to refer to later, actually. But um, it is uh, www.monroecc.edu slash wusers slash pcburger. And on this website, uh, I've got my normal faculty information. And I've got links to a number of different single variable calculus applets that I've created. Um, I also have links to my multivariable calculus project here. Now, um, I've created applets for several textbooks. Um, and I'm still in the process of doing that. Uh, that's something separate from, separate from what I'm going to present here. But the applets I've created for um, the John Wiley and Sons um, textbooks, they've allowed me to uh, have a link to them here. And you, you're welcome to explore those. There's a lot of topics there for single variable and multivariable calculus that you might find useful. Uh, I mean, I'll go to uh, the multivariable calculus website. This has got uh, a number of applets on it, um, some of which appear on the other page, too. But the calculus function grapher is the one I want to show first. Um, you click here. I've actually already opened it here. So I'm just going to go up to it. And this is the first applet I created uh, for the web. And I've done a bit of work to improve it. But you can move a point along a curve, graph a function of any kind. Uh, for example, we could put in uh, minus 2x and see how it, it changes the function. We can put a grid on it. You can right click on the graph to get a lot of options if you want to copy and paste these into uh, Word for tests and so on. Um, that's something that I do use this for. Not necessarily a calculus only idea then, but um, that's something that can be useful. If you want to make them smaller, by the way, for copy and paste, you can resize the window, um, making that smaller, and then that will make the number stay large while keeping the graph, or making the graph smaller. Now to focus on some things you can do with calculus here, I'm going to zoom in. And then I'm going to 
go down to this graph only line and show the derivative graph and the tangent line. Um, here, if you then click on the graph and move along it, you can see the tangent line and the derivative graph and make connections between the two. You know, we have a zero slope um, at the bottom where you have a, a positive slope. You're above the x-axis on the pink graph, the derivative graph. Here we've got a decreasing part of the function, so you're between the, the max and the min, you've got the function uh, negative below the x-axis and so on. Okay, and you can put any functions you want in here. I've got some preset ones, some of which are sort of interesting. Uh, let's see, the one that I think is fun uh, to do in this context, this particular question, is the absolute value of x squared minus 1. Uh, you get some very interesting results here with a discontinuous derivative graph. And I've really attempted in this applet to graph discontinuities accurately. I do include asymptotes and some other things in some of these functions that you can, you can look at. Now you can also uh, consider, if you choose the display option, to go down to show area function. And depending on your example, you can put whatever function you want in here. And thank you, Maria, <laughs> for the website or web address down there. But you can put in the um, uh, area function, and it makes this function now be the, what you're integrating. It makes it a function of t, and you can integrate from an a value, 0 in this case is the default, um, and see how that antiderivative would look. And this is an interesting function whose antiderivative is not trivial, but if you look down below, you can, it's probably a piecewise function, but if you look down below, there's some control features that you can use in this, this mode. In the area function mode, control T shows hides the tangent line, control A shows or hides the whole area function, and control D shows or hides F prime of, of X. So I could show you what that looks like here. Control A gives that whole function, control T gives the tangent line there, showing how its value or its slope is the same as the value on our blue original function. And so you can make some interesting discussions on this. All right, um, some other things that you can do here. I'm going to reset this to graph only. If you um, either right click on the f of x equals, you'll get the options of different types of graphs you can create. Uh, or if you right click over here and come down to graph type, you'll find the same options. And one thing that I found, uh, I couldn't find a good example of, was how to create piecewise functions with different uh, graphers. And so I tried to make one that was at least somewhat usable. And so you can see this has a function with three pieces. Um, it's got a different value at 0 up here at 5. And it does try to put circles and closed dots at endpoints when you have them. You can use IM, INF or infinity um, to work with infinity if you choose. So let's see, if I wanted to make it this piece be between 0 and um, five and then be four between five and infinity, although I could have just said greater than five. <laughs> it should work. Pressing enter doesn't work here to graph it, but if you hit graph, oops, I wouldn't you know I made an error here somehow. So um x is less than zero, zero to five. Let's try that. Nope. All right, well, I've got some kind of an error. Let me just try this back to x greater than 5. Sometimes when you think off the cuff here. There we go. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what I did wrong there. I'll have to take a look. could send a note. But infinity usually will work in some of those situations, but it's having a trouble there. So anyway, a piecewise function that you can create. You can also graph up to four functions here. Um, and uh, create graphs, and so on. All right, I'm going to now go to a different applet. Uh, there's a lot more that can be done there, but I um, just want to show you some various things, tools that you can use in your classes. This is a Riemann sum applet, and there's a lot of these applets out there. So this has got some new features that are, are not in some applets that you'll find, or some visualizations. It, of course, has the typical left hand, right hand, midpoint sum, trapezoid rule, um, options. And one I've had a hard time finding a good example of is the Simpsons rule, where we're looking at the area under parabolas. 
Um, so here, you know, it's got n equals 6. With Simpson's rule, it uses the even idea, although some books are different with us. It basically requires you to have an even subdivision, number of subdivisions, and then uses every two for one parabola. Uh, so you can see how you get various number of parabolas to approximate the area. And you can see how what you've got for the area here. Uh, it doesn't, it's not a function that you know. It's one actually that I just sort of made up, but it still gives you a good, a good ability to um, show what's going on. Uh, now, another one that I found useful is the idea, well, when we're trying to teach the idea that the, um, we don't have to use a uniform par uh, partition. Uh, in other words, these intervals don't have to all have the same width in the general definition of the definite integral. And some people don't necessarily go that far with it at this point, but I think it's important that students see it. And so I came up with a, a poor estimate example where we let n go to infinity, but we subdivide just one of these four. And so we end up with still a very poor estimate, even though we might have one part of it very nicely uh, approximated. The entire area between A and B is not accurate. Uh, then I chose a random partition where they're all different widths, and the partition is just randomly gener generated. We also are picking a random value within that interval rather than a left, right, or midpoint. And so it's getting closer to the definition, but still not going to work if you look at it. Um, you sometimes, if you do this enough times, will end up with really large subintervals out here still, even after 200 uh, iterations. So the one that actually does generate what cl what's closest to the definition, the general definition of the definite integral, is the random partition letting the dx or the delta x go to 0. So essentially what this does is it takes the largest subinterval and it subdivides that one. It's one way to do that. So it's something I hadn't found out there, and so it's something I thought might be worth showing to you. If you want to hide the points or the lines, it makes it a little bit easier to see. So these uh, choices are up there. All right, I wanted to, before I go into this next applet, I just wanted to see any response from people. Um, so in the chat, are people able to follow what I'm saying? Is it, is it uh, clear? And are you um, seeing what I'm, what I'm doing? Okay, so far so good. Great, okay. Wonderful. All right, uh, once in a while I get that coming up on my screen here. <laughs> Let's see. All right, so here's uh, an applet that I use in my, uh, my calculus 2. It's also something I use in differential equations. And to be honest, in Calc 2, I don't actually include the arrows. There's actually a second applet on my main web page that I showed first that says just slope field. And it starts by default without the arrows, um, but you may have your preference. You can change that here on the settings button to take the arrows out, and then you have just a normal slope field. Uh, for differential equations, uh, a lot of the applications I'm looking at, I want the arrows in there because of what we're considering. We're considering maybe different applications. This is a logistic um, differential equation and logistic curve that we've got graphed in it. Um, the idea of this applet is to allow you to, to enter any differential equation, although it does have to be in terms of x and y for this one to work. Um, so you can just change the, the, the um, variables. And so you can enter whatever you want here, but I've got some nice choices. And then you can, um, well, I, I, really what I want to do is get students to verify their solutions visually. And of course, I'll do this for them in class first. This is actually one of the main ways I find these applets uh, useful, is to do visual verification of various problems that we do either in class or that students do in their homework. And so in this case, you put the C, the constant uh, of integration, into the general solution. And you can either enter values down here in this text box, or you can come over and actually vary the value of C and, and just play with that and see that no matter what your value of C, the general solution, well, the particular solutions we get using the general solution and varying C all follow those, those slope, slope lines, or in this case, the direction vectors. Um, and you, you get a sense that you actually have a true solution. Of course, if we put something different in there, and you can either just pick something or <laughs> enter something different, but you, you see that we don't follow. And that's important, really, to show students what doesn't work and to show them why so they really get a sense of what's going on and when their answer really doesn't make sense. So here we're not following those arrows at all. 
uh, and we're going against the flow, um, not really working at all uh, in this case. So what we could do, um, let's see, is put in something like x minus y. This is one that I don't solve in calc uh, 2 with separation of variables because it's not possible to do that way. Uh, I do do it in differential equations, of course, uh, with an integrating factor, I believe. But um, I still have students do these kind of explorations where we're doing um, sort of drawing in the solutions or using uh, Euler's method. And so that would be something that would be connected to this uh, here. Now, this solution actually is on here. And I think it's this one, x minus 1 plus c times e to the negative x. And so if you vary here, we'll see that we indeed fit through this slope field. Now you can change the axes up here, format axes. Um, I made that so it's easy to make these different sizes. And if you've linked in on the one that asks you for a certificate or to approve the certificate, you can actually right click on this, um, well, left click on it actually, control C, and that copies it to the clipboard. And you can paste it into your documents uh, with this applet and my calc grapher applet. Also true with my calc plot 3D for multivariable calculus. All right, so let me go on now to uh, some other single variable calculus applets, but they show up in two places. They show up both on my multivariable calculus website because they are 3D. Um, so I have them right here, computing volumes. But they're also on my main faculty website that I showed earlier. Oops, get to the right place here. Um, right, well, go back on this right here. So. Um, this is my first uh, web website I showed. The computing volumes applets are all here too, as is the slope field and direction field applet that I mentioned, I just showed just now, and a few other things that you can look at. And again, all the applets I've made for some, some of the textbooks that are out there uh, that I've done some applets for. All right, um, so now I'm going to show um, the shell method applet. That applet can be found on either of those two web pages. And uh, I have a washer method one, two. I'm planning to, in the future, make this more general. But for now, it, it basically uses a fixed set of functions. Um, and so you're between these two curves, at y equals x squared and y equals the square root of x from 0 to 1. And what we can do then is to move the representative rectangle through the region. We can um, revolve that representative rectangle about the y-axis. This is the shell, shell method applet. Rotate it a little bit to see what that looks like. Uh, we can also revolve the region about the y-axis. And if we need to or want to rotate it. Now this applet, those of you with 3D glasses, you actually can turn the 3D option on, but currently it's sort of a hidden option or feature. So I believe it's control 3. Well, Control Shift three, yeah, that ends up being it. Control Shift three turns that on. So right now on my screen, it's in 3D. It, it may not show up quite as clearly if you've got the uh, it coming through the um, the Adobe Connect here. But when you try it on your own, you can try this later. So it's Control Shift three toggles that 3D glasses mode on and off. And right now that's sort of a dark mode, dark direction on it, but. Um, it's sort of a neat neat view that you can play with. All right, I'm going to turn that back off again since many of you didn't have those 3D glasses. Now something else you can do on this, and I'm going to sort of, well, let me take this back off. Gets a little bit unwieldy sometimes unless you're used to doing it, moving it around. You can always reset, and that will reset the applet to its original place. But you can move this. Um, shell back and forth. I didn't do that earlier through the region. And now I'm going to take that and unrotate it and show n shells. So the shells, we can actually show multiple shells and in this case revolve not just the region but now it's revolving the rectangles around. It's probably most interesting when it's partly revolved because you can see that cross section. Um, but when you go all the way around it shows you the volume of those four shells and how it compares to the actual volume of the solid, here the exact answer and here an approximation of it. We can increase the number of shells and at first this goes slowly but it stores them in memory so you can go more quickly once you've done it uh, a couple times. 
but you certainly get a sense for how these shells actually do approximate the solid. And you can see that even the volume of the 13 shells here is fairly close to the volume, actual volume of the solid of revolution. All right, and uh, if you go down to zero, no shells, it actually shows the surface, just in case you want to quickly get there and then go back to you know some shells and think about how that works. All right, um, another applet that I really had wanted to make for many years before I actually made it, but was uh, an applet to help visualize volumes of a common cross section. So I've I've made one and um, and it works fairly well. It's actually more general than the shell and washer method applets. So you've got the ability here to um, change the region that you're using it as a base here, and we can also change which cross sections we use. Uh, we can move that cross section through the region, see how that will form a solid. We can generate the solid. You can rotate it if you want to. Um, Oops, you got to click on it to, to make it be the active thing to left, go left and right on. Left and right arrows move the rotation about the z-axis. That's a useful thing to know about. You can also use the uh, mouse, but it gets difficult to maybe get it where you want it to be. We can change uh, what shape is there. We could use um, equilateral triangles, for example. Uh, here they're perpendicular to the x-axis. You can also make them perpendicular to the y-axis, and that changes what you end up with for a volume and a shape. Um, you can change the, the base. So say, for example, we wanted to get a um, circle um, for the base. I've got one built in here as a, as a default. Uh, this one happens to be already uh, perpendicular to the y-axis. So uh, let's see, let's go from negative 2 to 2. And so here we have sort of one of the typical uh, shapes that comes up in some of the books, sort of like a soldier hat or something. Um, it's not centered right now because of the, the default uh, function. You can format axes to change that and uh, get it to be where you want it to be. You can also, I think, alt and use alt and left and right arrows and down arrows to move around. That's a hidden feature that can be useful at times. Um, all right, let's see. So we could put some different shapes over this circular region, um, say a square above. And um, this actually also, this region, allows us to get the intersection of two cylinders. And usually in a live uh, presentation, I'll try to get people to tell me how to do that, uh, what shape I need, what cross-section I need. Uh, anybody know um, which cross-section will give us the intersection of two cylinders? Takes a second to enter <laughs> something, I suppose, here. But well, I've given some wait time, but not enough, I'm sure. Uh, it turns out square centered on the base um, is the one that will give us the intersection of two cylinders. So, sort of an interesting one. Again, you might have to reset the, or change the format axes here to get it to be where you want it to be, or use the Alt, up and down, left and right arrow keys to move it around. Okay, but you can put any of the problems that you do in here and you know, generate overheads, uh, color overheads. I do that sometimes. Um, or uh, do something for a, a homework or a test that has a visual on it. So those kind of things could be useful for you. All right, so now I'm ready to look at multivariable calculus. So for those of you who don't teach it yet, maybe I'll inspire you to choose to teach it in the future. Um, but uh, you can also share this with your colleagues who do teach it. Uh, so this applet, I spent uh, a number of years uh, really creating. I created it first in Visual Basic in 2003, and then uh, began to learn Java and, and, and write applets. And um, the NSF grant I got in 2000, well, beginning of 2008, is when I really began to put a lot of effort into making this particular applet come to life. But it allows you to graph functions of two variables. Um, in rectangular coordinates, in cylindrical coordinates, spherical coordinates, and a number of other things, as you'll see. Uh, but here we can just grab it and rotate it around. Uh, we can uh, look at a contour plot. And so here it gives you some choices. We want to use the function we've got visible right now. 
Choose a first level, negative 1, step size of 0.2. The number of contours, uh, this is the default of 11. It's, dif it's um, assuming you want them equally spaced. If you don't, you can enter a list of levels you want. Pressing OK gives us the contour plot. And it gives us some direction above the plot here. Click on the contour plot to view the contours in 3D. And so we can talk about the contour plot itself, but then it's sort of interesting then to see how it relates to the three-dimensional surface. And so now we can see that those indeed are um, level curves that are taken at evenly spaced slices uh, in the vertical Z direction. But we see that they are closer together on the XY plot that we have, the contour plot, where the function's steeper. And of course, I get my students to tell me that. Um, but that's helpful to begin to see. You can click on this and generate a trace point. You can do this without the contours as well, but um, on the surface and see where you're at uh, compared to the contour plot. Another thing that you might find interesting in this situation is to consider gradient vectors. Later in the course, uh, you, you want to see how gradient vectors are, how they relate to the contour plot. And if you click here, um, you can actually see the gradient vector in the contour plot to the left. It's probably very small for you right now um, in the context of this webinar. But um, you can see it in the surface over here as well and see how it's pointing in the direction of greatest increase in slope uphill. And if we want to see this up here and big on the screen on the contour plot, we could have done that actually, drawing the contour plot again and then clicking on it, we can see it out there in a little bit bigger image. Seeing how we're pointing uphill, and then here that must be a pit because we're pointing uphill out of the pit. Here it's a peak, you're pointing uphill toward the peak, no matter where you're at in there. And then again out of a hole, uh, uphill. So, But notice the gradient vectors are always uh, normal to the contour plots or contour lines, no matter where you're at. It's something that you could use to, to demonstrate that visually, bring it home. Uh, for the students. Now I've built a number of little icons under the applet to help make things a little bit faster. One thing I use a lot in my presentations is reset applet. It's sort of a recycle uh, symbol here that just sort of sets it back to the original uh, image of what it was. There are a few things that may not be reset but it really uh, resets most things and I try to reset everything. Um, let's see. Trying to think in terms of time, how to budget what I've got left. Let me show you a couple more things here, and then we're going to look at some other polls that I'm going to ask you some questions. So I'm going to clear this. Well, let me show you a few other functions you can graph. You can enter anything you want here. So um, we could actually enter x squared plus y squared. Well, it had to be capitalized. Plus 1, for example. And it will graph that. Um, if you want to sort of zoom out from it, you can just use the scroll bar on your mouse to do that. Um, you can also use control I for, for making it come in closer or control O for moving it out. But the, the scroll bar or scroll button wheel I should say on the, the mouse works the best. Um, you can make it transparent with well either the view setting menu, which is currently a little bit overwhelming, but there are there are shortcut keys that you can use. Um, this is this option here, make surfaces transparent. It's control T for transparency. I use that most often. You can also hide the edges. That's on that list or menu as well, but E hides the edges. Now if you want the 3D version to come out well, you want the edges really to be on there. It looks a little bit better. And If you have your 3D glasses, I could try this one more time here. Turning that on, uh, this makes the um, image become 3D. And it's sort of half in the screen and half out so that it's a little bit more comfortable mode to look at. But um, really can be very useful, especially for students who are trying to get a sense for what's going on here um, outside of class. Now, you can also um, graph vector fields. And a vector field that would be relevant to this example would be, and I'm going to the graph menu, graph of, add a vector field. Um, would be its gradient vector field. And so we could put here a 2x, which would be the partial with respect to x for the first component, 2y, which is the partial of this function with respect to y for the second component, 
we're going to divide the vector links by 4 so that they're not all overlapping each other. And then graph, there's 9 each way, um, really none along the z-axis, just one along the z-axis because this is left blank. But this actually is a gradient vector field in the xy plane underneath the surface. And it, it can be useful to consider you know, how it's pointing in the uphill direction and the vectors are getting longer as the surface is getting steeper. So anyway, you can use that to talk about that connection. You can also uh, show the, the um, gradient vector at a point again if you wanted to in this context. And it's got its true length, so it's a little bit, well, four times as long as the actual vectors are there. And you can begin to see how that relates to the surface. And there are a lot of different example functions you might find even better than this one. All right, I'm going to reset that. Notice that some things get shown up there, the gradient vector, in this case, and its magnitude. All right, one other thing I'm going to show, if I clear this and go to graph at a space curve, um, there are a lot of different examples in here. Uh, the, the default one is a spiral, sort of a helix, and you can animate this, show how that you move up this. Let me actually right-click, move this over a little bit, that's a nice trick to do as a teacher. You sometimes have to move the actual focus of the screen over. And then we'll zoom in a little bit. And now we're going to add a velocity vector and the acceleration vector. And we can actually move this along here using the scroll bar too. And you can get a sense for where these are at. Uh, the acceleration vector in this particular example points toward the z-axis. The velocity always, of course, is going to be tangent to the curve and like the headlights of your car as you drive along it. So if you animate that again, you can actually see the motion with both the, um, well, with the position vector, the velocity, and the acceleration vector. Now another example that's sort of nice is the coil ring. Let me actually zoom out from that a little bit. And here I'm going to hide the acceleration and velocity and show the TNB frame with all its features. So that's a quick way to get the whole thing. Now, if we animate that, some of you may have taught the TMB frame, and this gives a way to actually get it to come alive. It's, it can be a little difficult to calculate those vectors themselves, but here you can sort of see what they would be in approximate form and really get a sense of the visual of, in this case, sort of taking a flight around this path and how dizzy you'd feel if you were actually doing that. <laughs> All right, um, I'd like to uh, pause now to come back to my um, slideshow and let's see here recently shared yeah okay so hopefully this is coming up for everybody um, the um, Sorry for my pause here. Um, the next thing I wanted to show here was the uh, ways of using the applets. Uh, we've talked about it some already, but just to quickly uh, go through that and then maybe show some more features of the multivariable calculus applet and answer questions. Um, but first, and probably the thing that's get done most often is that instructors can use these applets to visually demonstrate the concepts during class. And I think it's also very useful, and you probably agree, to visually verify results of homework problems or problems that are examples that you've done in class and uh, get students to see that they really make sense. And I think also I mentioned earlier the what-if scenarios are really useful and that uh, space curve, uh, those examples I was just looking at, um, maybe even just even looking at the plane curve generating a, a circle, uh, you can parameterize a circle in so many different ways that that's a great example to do a what-if uh, analysis on what if we parameterize it with uh, different things instead of just the cosine of t and sine of t. Use cosine of t squared and sine of t squared, for example. Uh, second thing, students can use them to explore the concepts visually outside of class, um, either using a guided activity or on their own. Uh, I found that I, I have to grade some assignments that require the students to do this to get them started with it. But at least in multivariable calculus, once they get started uh, using the applet, I find that many of them do use it more on their own. But uh, they do a majority of their exploration when they're required to do so, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, instructors can use some of the applets, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Calc Grapher, Slope Field, and Calc Plot 3D, uh, to create graphs for visual aids, like color overheads, uh, create worksheets, 
handouts, guided guided notes, um, or even for your tests. I do multiple choice. Well, no, I do matching between um, functions of two variables and their actual surface plots. I also do matching between uh, slope field, no, vector fields, I'm sorry, uh, and their vector field equations. And you can do that easily if you use the app. You can generate new examples and, and get the students also to play with it enough that they can become comfortable doing that kind of a matching exercise. Um, next, uh, you can also use the CalcPlot 3D applet to create lecture demonstrations. There's a way to save scripts, um, basically a, a dynamic slideshow. Someone asked there, did please give an example of a graded applet activity. One of the things that I've used was the direction field applet, or more specifically the slope field applet. And I've, I have a handout if you're interested. You know, I can put it on the, the website that I'm going to give you a link to at the end. I'm still creating the website, so you'll uh, I'll probably by the end of the day have everything up there. But um, a web page that I'll put on this this lab that I give. But the students are asked to um, do some differential equations using separation of variables to solve them, come up with a general solution, and then they're asked to enter that differential equation into that applet, and then enter their general solution, and then of course to vary the value of c and and print a couple of or one interesting view of it with an interesting C value, but just to verify that their solution worked, visual verification. Um, I've done many similar um, assignments for Calc 3. Again, multivariable calculus is what I've been doing the most work on recently with my, my NSF grant. Um, but I've got a whole handout that I will put on this website that is about visually verifying homework problems. Um, for example, the intersection of two planes is a line. Uh, you can graph both the planes and the line of intersection as a space curve and, and ver verify visually by rotating it around that it truly intersects the, uh, well, is in the intersection of the two planes. Um, you can verify that you've got the correct equation of a tangent plane. You can visually verify that you've got the correct uh, Taylor polynomial equations uh, and a number of other things. So. There's more, many more things in that list of examples that um, are of that sort of thing. I hope that that's answered that question um, fairly well. Um, I am going to be giving a two-hour workshop on using CalcPlot 3D in teaching multivariable calculus, um, as well as creating these scripts that I just mentioned just above this at Amatic 2011 in Austin in November. So if you're interested um, in that, uh, please plan to attend that. Now. I have a poll, let's see, poll number 10, uh, Maria, that just gives a sense of what else you might wanna, like to see. Some of these topics we've talked about already, but um, in case you want to see a couple more things in that. But you can also post any questions you have on the chat window. Now, Maria, I noticed that the slideshow disappeared. I, I assume it can come back up. There is one slide at the very end that I'll want to use, but it's just my contact info. Not that important. All right, so I'm just keeping track of what's here so I can get a sense. Parametric surfaces are up there, and Taylor polynomials of a function of two variables. Uh, vector fields we've looked at one of, but uh, we could look at another one there. Um, tangent planes, OK. All right, well, let's take a look at a couple of these things. Um, uh, Taylor polynomials and parametric surfaces, two things that I'd like to do here anyway. So I need to share my screen again. Um, Maria, I'm not seeing what I normally had up here to share my screen. Uh, there we go. All right, almost there. All right, so let me reset my applet. Hopefully you can see this. And I'm going to show, first of all, the parametric surfaces. That's pretty quick. So. I'm going to clear this screen and go up to Graph, Add a Parametric Surface. And sometimes it's helpful to have this in quick plot mode because some of these take a while to graph. But if there's any intersection um, with various surfaces, it, it should be turned off. But here I'm going to put it on, and we can choose some popular examples, or you can enter your own. It's, it's just I put a lot of interesting examples in here. Several Klein bottles. I've got one here. This is actually one where turning it off would be helpful uh, because the self-intersection is much better in the standard graphing mode. 
it just takes a little bit longer to, to render it. If I um, use the option I mentioned earlier, Control T, to make it semi-transparent, it makes it even better. And this is actually a great example for the 3D option. For anybody with 3D glasses, um, it uh, sort of makes it come out of the screen at you. Again, it will work better probably outside of this mode of being in the webinar because the graphics are a little bit maybe less impressive here. Let me turn that back off again. And let me just show a couple more examples of this. Um, Klein bottle number three is actually one in, in two parts, and it looks a little nicer. Uh, it uh, just gives us the sense of this topological surface, which honestly uh, we don't do quite as much with in Calc 3, but if, you've taught, you know, if you were thinking of topology or something, this would be fun to work with. But sometimes I show my students things that we don't explicitly cover, but which sort of lure them into the beauty of mathematics, which I guess was something I didn't mention earlier, but is another reason I think it's so fun to do these kind of visualizations. All right, now, a more typical one to use to um, maybe teach this topic of parametric surfaces would be a Mobius strip. And so this is a very simple one. You can actually see the full definition of x, y, and z in terms of u and v. These are the two parameters that are being used. You can change the ranges. Um, you can use pi for pi and so on um, there. You can actually enter other functions in there and should understand them too. But you can hit uh, show a trace point and we can vary, um, move a trace point along the curve and see what value of u is being used to generate that. Right now v is zero. And then we can move um, the V one and show what V is doing to generate the surface. And I've got some other ideas for this summer to expand some of the features here to put um, a rectangle or maybe some other shape down here and make this a UV plane and then be able to change the size of that. And there's actually an applet that will be up under Hughes Hallett's uh, applets that does do exactly that. If you want to look there, John Wiley and Sons. All right, now uh, Taylor polynomials was another question. Let me go to that. Um, got left up here. There's still a couple things that get <laughs> not reset. So to do a Taylor polynomial, I'm going to find a function that's actually particularly suited to it. Um, cosine of x times sine of y is a sort of a nice example to see this. So what this is is, is basically akin to what you do in in maybe a Calc 2 class where you talk about the Taylor polynomials of a function of one variable. Um, we go up to Tools and view Taylor polynomials, and this will generate uh, Taylor polynomials in two variables for the function that you give. It tries to do as many as, as high a degree as possible up to about 15th degree sometimes. So first we get our first degree, which is a tangent plane. You can actually move back to the zero degree, which is a horizontal, um, basically a plane with a value of the function that's there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we can then move up to a higher degree and see what we get. Um, that fits the function surface much better. And we see it's certainly tangent and has the same curvature uh, at near the origin. We can change that point if we wanted to under tools, um, set the point about which we center. But I don't do that for many of the examples I show just because I don't do as much um, variety there. Um, but um, we can also show using factorials in the Taylor in the denominators here to talk about how these are generated if uh, that's of interest. Okay, I got to note that we're just about out of time, but um, to show a couple more degrees there, and you can see how much better that fits. We can zoom out and see how much better it fits there too. Uh, eventually, it breaks down anyway because of the um, floating point arithmetic done in the computer, but certainly it's sort of neat to see how it fits the surface. All right. Um, well, what questions are there? Well, if I can um, jump in, I have a little bit of bookkeeping to do here at the end. <laughs> Excellent. Um, the first thing I want to do is um, pull up my slides. Let me see. Let me find them here. Do I need to stop sharing, I assume? Yeah. Thank you. I just did that. OK. So. Um, first, I think we should um, definitely give Paul a little round of applause because that was great. And I think um, he's got some great stuff that we can all um, 
we can all use. And I didn't even find the right applause button. I can't figure out how to use this thing now. Uh, again, I just remind you that this webinar is um, sponsored by Amatic, and they're free. And I hope you all appreciate that and let Amatic know how much you enjoy them. Um, uh, just a couple more little things. Uh, Amatic does have a Facebook page. We try to post announcements about webinars and, um, and videos and things like that there. So you can check us out there. Um, you can find recordings of all the past Amatic webinars and eventually the recording of this webinar, which is um, at uh, the this link right here, um, bitly.amatic webinars. And um, finally, um, we would really appreciate it if you would take about two minutes um, to type this while I talk, which is a little bit difficult, to um, fill out the evaluation for this webinar, give us suggestions for future webinars, and um, if you need a confirmation of your participation, there's a space to do that right at the end of this link. Um, I'm also going to put up here one last link, which is a Zoom link. Um, I've just got to finish generating it. Um, let me see. Which means I have to get through the CAPTCHA. Six, seven, um, which I did not get through. Let me try again. You're all filling out that evaluation. Um, so this is a Zoom link, and what it is is a collection of all the links from this webinar. So if you um, can't, don't have, didn't have time to grab all the links, but you want them, if you just copy and paste this Zoom link at the end here, um, and it's just Amatic Web 08. If um, if you can't get it from the window for some reason, it will actually give you the links to everything else that I shared in the window and the Facebook page and the evaluation. Um, I'm going to switch this back over to um, Paul's PowerPoint for his contact information. At least I'm going to try to. Give me a second here. Mm -hmm. And Maria, I have, one, I have a web page I'm still in the process of finalizing, but I can put that on that. You can put that on that too if I send it to you, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know if I can add it Same to the place. Zoom link, but um, okay. yeah, you can put it. If not. I'll send it or have you send it out or however. So here's Paul's contact information. And um, if it's OK with Paul, if he has the time, he can just um, maybe hang out for a couple minutes just in case there's any last questions. Certainly. In the meantime, I suspect most people are filling out their little evaluation, which is great. Thank you very much. And um, we'll just hang out here. And uh, as you disappear, we'll know everything's cool. <laughs>